Hey everybody, I'm Yvonne Williams with Back to Earth Creations and in this video I'm going to teach y'all how to make your very own leather leaf purse pouch using the template, the other pieces of the template that we have available up on our Patreon for the digital download content and then also for sale on our Etsy. All of the links for the different tools and materials and everything, all the links, will be down below in the video description. So um, let's get started. So this is how your template will look after you print it off. I'm still learning Inkscape, so until we get that all figured out, it's hand-drawn. <laughs> so um, I have a one-inch square marked out on each of the papers so you can know the scale whenever you print it off. Um, if you enlarge it or shrink it, just do it uniformly across all the pages and it still should fit together. So I'm going to begin by cutting out along the bold lines of all of our pieces, and I'll meet you back right here. So now that we have everything cut out, you can see here, this is the section for the loop for the belt. Do not cut on that dotted line. And the reason why I didn't add this in as a whole nother separate template piece is this part is very optional. On this finished piece here, I had designed it to where it would fit, you know, a belt through the loop, but you could just as easily do some loop attachments here on the shoulders of the bag and make this into a short, like a purse, like a, you know, over the shoulder. Um, you could keep it as a clutch. You could have, but you know, whatever you can think of. So that part is very optional. But you can take one of the pieces of scrap from the paper that you printed out on and just line this up and trace over it. Belt loop. Ta-da! Just like that. Um, snip it out. Do, do, do. Um, and now you're going to want to take some scotch tape or packaging tape or masking tape or do, I mean something sticky that will hold paper together. So gusset part A and gusset part B and you can see it has AB and AB on either side of the dotted line. So we're going to line up that dotted line and tape it. If you uh, want to give it a little bit of extra you would extend this way some. Um, that would give you more shoulder coming up this way and you can always trim that off again like trim it off shorter later but um this is the same measurement that i used and i'm i haven't had to trim but just make sure you don't make it too short because then you will run out of material before you need to so i'm just taping down flipping it over tucking that tape over coming over onto this side and taping it down as well now we're going to do this same thing to the back side of the pouch and the leaf. We're just going to line up where the A and B are lining up. There's that. And there's that. And then flipping it over, tucking the tape over, and then taping it down on this side. Some folks really like laminating their templates. Here I'm just, I have it out on a computer paper, but cardstock or freezer paper would work really well also. So now we have all the different pieces for our bag. The next step is going to be to trace this onto our leather. I'm using around a three or four ounce leather. Um, you want it to be thick enough and a stiff enough of a vegetable tan that it will hold the sculpting and will take a nice tooling effect. So um, I'm going to get that traced up and then we will come back here. Now also though the belt loop and the gusset are going to be done on, I'm doing them on garment leather which is much softer. You can do it on vegetable tan, it'll just have a much stiffer, uh, your bag will sit more like this as opposed to being nice and compressed.
Okay, so the etched line that I did isn't showing up as well on camera as what it is in real life. Um, so I am going to set this here so you can get an idea. Um, I'm coming through with a 1 4th inch hole punch and in each of these little insets I'm going to start just on this side that way I don't miss any. So I moved the camera that way I don't hit it with the hammer but I'm going to be placing here in each of these grooves and then just getting a nice solid placement on each like not solid placement um solid cut through like I don't want to just go like that and have like the outline there we want a nice cut um so I'm going to move this now it's just in my way but that way I mean on each and every in curve So now we have a couple of different options. We can come through and cut with our scissors, if you can kind of see. And that gives us that little bit of an effect. But I really like to come in with my box knife. And I like to start at the circle that we cut out, the hole that's been punched and cut away from our main leaf. There we are. Just like that. And I'm pressing much harder than what I need to and it's actually cutting into my mat. Um, but I want to make sure I have a nice clean cut and connection. There we go. So you can see how that's starting to come out. And it's going to look almost artificially straight at first but as we do the texturing and tooling and sculpting and stuff that will really um, diminish like we don't want and you know you might if you want a very crisp almost like Canadian flag maple um, you know very straight edged you can totally do that it's it's more of a stylistic thing I almost prefer a more um, natural wrinkled flowy look but also keep in mind too, if you like majorly mess up or something there's no such thing as messing up leaves in nature are so unique their variation of insect damage or sun scald or like a squirrel or something ate that one like it's you know you could have a uh, battle damage more or less um, on your natural leaves there's no um, there's no right or wrong to this there really isn't And this could actually be a point too. I don't like how much my cutting mat is moving around. So I'm going to move down to my larger mat underneath my surface. Yeah, and this makes me feel a lot more stable in what I'm doing. Oops. So like right there, I cut over too far. That's okay. That just becomes part of it. Also, this mat doesn't grab the blade nearly as much as this white one does. So I feel like I'm having an easier time cutting through. Just always, always be mindful to keep your fingers out of your line of cutting. Like, don't... No, that's such a big no-no. Um, I try to keep my hand actually behind where I'm cutting. And be careful if you're cutting like this, you don't want to, like, gut yourself. Um... And just go slow you know there's no sense in rushing it and messing up um, if you feel like your hands are getting tired take a break the leather will still be here also you'll notice I am cutting dry leather um, wet leather has quite a bit more stretch to it um, and I don't want the pattern distorting just yet so that's why 
I've chosen to work with a dry leather right now. You can experiment um, and see whichever you prefer. Um, but I prefer working with the dry. There we go. More little snipping. And so I'm going to finish up cutting this out and then I'll meet you guys back here for the next step. So if I had thought ahead and drawn this out on freezer paper that has a waxy side or printed it on tracing film or anything like that, what I would do is I would spritz the leather until the surface were just damp. And then I would place the leaf over it and use, oh, where's it at? There it is. Like a ball stylus to trace over the line work. Or you could be completely unique and draw out your own. Um, and again, I like more of a whimsical fantasy. So I'm not really paying attention to where the actual natural veining and stuff would be. So I am going to have it kind of branch down each like lobe of the leaf though. I'm not too worried about having it be symmetrical or anything like that. Just have fun. Fill it in. Um, do what makes you happy. I'm going to do some little curly cues. I'm coming off this way. Um, and you can't even really see very much what I was doing. But now um, I am going to case this part. And since it's quite thin and I want this to go by rapidly, instead of holding it under the water until the bubbles stop, like completely submerging it and letting it soak up as much water as it physically can, and then taking it out of the water and letting it dry, um, almost back to its original color, um, I am just going to spritz it with a water bottle. And here you can see that's really bringing out the lines that I had drawn on because it scored the smooth surface and so it's drinking up that water very quickly. And you can see how that spreads. And I'm kind of pulling a little bit like onto my work surface and everything. That way, oh, and it's making a mess. So you can take some paper towel and make sure that you don't flood yourself out of the house. But um, for the most part, the leather should do a pretty good job of soaking it all up. And so I am going to let this soak up a little bit more. And then I'm going to let it come back to not a fully dry color, but more like this color. But I don't want it to take more water. So I'm going to just let it do its thing and then I'll meet you guys back here whenever it's ready to start cutting and tooling. So here you can see the leather, um, it looks much lighter than what it actually is just because of the way the camera's picking up on the lights. Um, but you can see it's not quite wanting to take more water. So it is ready to uh, start being cut. And so this is a swivel knife and I've stropped it, which is I've got jeweler's rouge on a piece of leather and I just sharpen up the blade a bit. And what's great about the swivel knife, you could just use a regular old craft knife, but I like this little swivelly saddle that you let your finger rest in because that lets you put pressure from above while still controlling the way that the knife is moving. And so I'm just going to slice it down. And I've never cut all the way through my leather with a swivel knife um, without like doing multiple and multiple um, layers so I wouldn't worry too much about that whenever you're coming back to the spine um, you could meet up with the line that you had just done but I like to actually come out just a bit and you will understand more about that later whenever we start doing the tooling there we go and it's just giving us some nice deep base lines And then you can throw some of your tools on the ground. <laughs> Fortunately, leather tools are super durable. And so, oh, thank you. I'm just going to keep 
doing some little cuts of it building off into the other stuff that we're doing. And then from here, I'm going to let this dry just a little bit more before we start tooling. Because um, whenever you use a texture stamp, which the tools that I'm going to be using are these ones, I really like the, um, the texture on these. If you can hear, it's got this little like crosshatch, um, crosshatching going on. Um, and that leaves a nice imprint into the leather that the antique gel that we're going to be going over um, will settle very nicely into. And I've got two sizes of beveler foot, feet, beveler foots, um, and a pear shader. And this is the large pear shader. And so, you know, it's probably ready. So I'm going to set this up on its bricks. And here I have a pounder board with an inch and a half granite slab on top of it and I'm going to begin by going through with our beveler foot not beveler foot pear shader and I'm bringing it very close to the edge of our leaf I'm going to try really hard to do this without hitting the camera but I'm bringing it I mean real close to the edge and see how it just kind of pinches off that uh that leather let me zoom in just a bit more do, do, do. there we go yeah that's what i'm going for i i want to completely decimate the edge <laughs> of the leather And there I go, hitting the camera. And so I am going to continue hammering. I'm going to continue hammering and texturing all the way around. Um, and then we'll actually be coming through with the beveler foot. And you can see here where I have these cuts. I'm going to just position the beveler like this, and it's called walking it. And what I'm doing is each time that you tap it, the beveler jumps just a little bit. And you can guide and control. It takes quite a bit of practice, but that's what scrap leather is for. But you can guide and control where it kind of jumps to. Um, and if you're just starting out, I really recommend placing tapping, placing, tapping. It's super slow, but you'll eventually build up to where you can start getting a little bit more control. And I'm just going to go through and kind of follow along the edges. Um, I'm not going to be functioning directly on the uh, lines until I get close to the tips, and then I'm going to I'll demonstrate on this one. So see how I started to kind of bring it in there? And I'm just going to kind of, whenever I'm doing a big pro or bigger project like this, I'll go through and do it from one direction on all the sides. So. Just like that. just like that and then I would do that down all the veins and then I would do that down all the veins and then I would turn the project around and come at it from the other side which what that will look like will be
just like that. And you can see that helps give it a little bit more depth and dimension and shaping. And I don't mind writing along on the line sometimes if I feel like I've been writing it for too long. I'll kind of offset and come back here and give it a little bit more of um, a detail and variation. And so that's how I kind of go about it. And again, this could be, I mean, a fantasy leaf, you know, a leaf of no species known to mankind. Um, it doesn't really matter if you like the way that it looks, if it makes you happy, then you're doing it correctly. Um, or you can have a reference image directly by your side and get every single perfect little vein. And if that makes you happy, then you're doing it right. <laughs> so um, I'm going to finish that up across the rest of the leaf and then I'll meet you guys right back here for the next step. So now that we have all of our tooling done, I'm going to go through with a gel antique. So this is EcoFlow available from Tandy Leather. Um, shake it up quite nicely and you'll see for, for applying it, I have these nitrile gloves on. Um, I prefer to just kind of go like this where I'm globbing it on and then I'm just going to smear it around. And so I'm going to throw this into time lapse and show y'all how that happens. So now that I have it all pretty much spread around, um, I'm actually going to flip them over. And you can see here I have my work surface covered with um, a big piece of freezer paper with the waxy side up. And what that does is it you know, kind of keeps my work surface clean, but it also um, lets me smear up the excess. It doesn't soak up the stain. And so I have some here in my hand, and I'm just going to spread that a bit. And then three squirts of water, or however much, use your judgment. Since this is the inside, I only want to tint it. And so applying a little bit of water helps um, dilute it around a little bit. And I especially want to make sure that all the little crevices and crannies and edges are nice and stained. Get a little bit more. This is really thick, so it keeps gooping up. But I'm just going to keep doing this, and then I'll meet you all right back here. Um, actually, before before I let it sit and dry, I'm going to use a pad of paper towel and... Um, Now that I've applied it evenly all over the surfaces, I have some paper towel that I am getting kind of damp. And then I'm going to buff off the excess stain. Now this not only removes the excess stain, 
but it also seals the pores of the leather so don't hesitate to kind of press a bit you can see this is really removing a lot of those pigments and waxes off of the surface <clears throat> and this is just the back side <laughs> So now we can flip this over and you'll really get to see how it looks whenever um, on the uh, surface of the leather. So it really brightens it up to buff it. And the antique gel does such a good job of settling into all of those finer details of the uh, tooling that we've done. Now, something you'll need to be mindful of wearing gloves is that um, you can redeposit uh, almost Mm, pigmented fingerprints onto the surface so just be mindful of that and now I'm going to set this off to the side to dry I really like how that came out and finish buffing it up but I'm gonna let it dry completely and then um, you can see here I actually just sprayed the surface of the leather I'm all right with doing that um, whenever it's just a flat piece like this, but whenever it's a textured piece like the leaf here with the tooling, I prefer to not do that because I don't want to uh, water down the pigment that's in, down in the crevices of the tooling, if that makes sense. Also, if you wanted to add other colors with um, either alcohol or water-based stains, also by EcoFlow or Fivings, Thievings, um, I would do that before the gel antique. The gel antique is very waxy, and so it has a tendency to behave almost like a repel. Um, and other dyes now won't um, penetrate quite as well as they would have if they were going directly onto bare leather. So on that note, I'm going to finish up here, and then I'll meet you guys back here for the next step. So here you can see we have some different options. You could wet the leather um, and twist it up and sculpt it to give like some dimension to the leaf, or you could leave it completely flat. I'm going to show you how to do the sculpting and stuff for if you decide to do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to dampen this up a little bit by spritzing on some water. Now, I haven't sealed the leather yet, so it's still, even with the stain on, um, kind of readily absorbs the liquid. So, you'll definitely want to do any sculpting and wet molding before, um, before you, uh, put on your, like, super sheen or acrylic resin or your, uh, Aussie wax or anything like that. Now, also, you can see quite a bit's coming off on my hands, so I don't want to put too much here on the front, because, again, it might lift out that antique gel. But, so we have it placed, and I'm just kind of dabbing it off. You don't want it to be sopping wet. And then, you can just kind of pinch and stretch and twist some of the different parts of the leaves. I try to be pretty random about it and I've actually, the way I did this one, um, is I just bunched them up and then I used a hair tie with no metal components or anything and just loosely put it on like that and then let it dry, just air dry like that and then whenever you remove the hair tie, it starts to relax out a little bit, but you can see it has a little bit more dimension and movement now as opposed to just being completely flat. So I am going to keep doing that. I would not recommend using a rubber band or anything with like metal pieces on it that might scratch or gouge or indent the leather um, because that will become obvious. And also, 
eh, you could have it poke outwards whenever you're like kind of training it with the sculpting, but I prefer to have a little bit of like more of a um, like rounded over because then it'll more naturally be more naturally inclined to be in a closed position, even if you decide to not necessarily snap it back. Um, and it won't snag on stuff as much. So there we go. I'm just gonna, and you can roll, you can twist, you can, I like to kind of fold in half and then pull a little bit and that gives it some nice shaping. So just experiment. I mean, again, you could go through a pile of dry leaves in the fall and each one's going to be different. So there's no, really is no right or wrong way to do this. So there we have some really nice shaping. There we go. And so now the next step from here is we are going to use a four prong. Well, I had one that did diagonal, but I'm not entirely certain where I put it. Here it is. You could use straight prongs, but I prefer the diagonal prongs just because I like the way that it makes the laces lay with a really nice like movement, if that makes sense. If I did the straight lacing, like the straight prong, they'd be more, you know, and we'll try it with the straight laces this time, or with the straight prong this time, just so we can compare and contrast the different um, effects that it can get. And if you're using this, I do really recommend having another individual chisel for fitting in whenever you can't fit everything. Now from here, you could use a tool called a wing divider to delineate a little border. I, most of the time, I just eyeball it, um, but I've been doing this for a minute. So if you're new or you just like really pristine, clean looking work, a wing divider can be your best friend. So I'm just going to start lightly etching this around the border. The camera doesn't really pick up on it, but I can see it. And really, you don't want this. You could do, you know, a decorative border like that, but for just where the lacing is, you don't really have to, like, gouge in there. And so I've got that marked. And I actually want to do the front panel first because you you'll only need this much worth of the holes so if I continued punching I don't necessarily need lacing up there on the sides though we could if we wanted to kind of extend that up a bit again so much of this is your own personal design preference so so I'm just following the border around here on the front and uh, I wouldn't go underneath like closer to the edge than like an eighth of an inch I prefer a quarter inch or you know five millimeters um, just to um, I never have to worry about it ripping the leather out at that point so now we'll just take our chisel and I'm going to place it here just right along that line that we have marked with our ring divider. And then I'm gonna use my mallet. And you wanna make sure to get a really nice, clean punch all the way through. I mean, you don't wanna be chomping into your cutting mat, but I do try to get till about that far. Maybe a little farther, honestly. Oops, hitting the tripod. And you can pull it out. You can, if you want it to remove easier, you can put um, some Aussie wax or some beeswax onto your chisel. But um, I just wrench it out. So, and then I line up my new placement with the first time with the last hole, and that way I'm punching three new holes, but it's keeping my placement very um, equally spaced. You know, cutting it around corners can be a little difficult. And so whenever we do that, instead of lining up, I'll just eyeball it a little bit. Oops, hit 
tripod again. Um, and just follow around like this until it starts to straighten back out. And so I'm going to continue doing this all the way around. And it's actually, I think, a lot easier now that I'm thinking about it with the straight chisel because now it doesn't really matter which angle I come at the other two pieces. You know, the, uh, the gusset, that's the word. Sorry, I was trying to remember. What is this word? Um, the gusset. Um, and the back plate whereas if you're using the angled chisel and you're putting it in you want the angle slant to be the same on each of the three pieces that you're going to be punching so we're just going to continue around with the uh, straight chisel and then I will meet you guys back here to put the other pieces together I have finished the first panel of hole punching and then I'm lining up with where I want the holes to be on this panel and you can see I wasn't exactly perfect about my cuts I'm not really like a tidy person um, when it comes to things like that um, but it's still lining up for the most part and that's something that if you are very particular uh, trim it down and restain it or just you know be as clean as you want to be but I'm going to just punch through this first panel into the second one, lining up, making sure that I'm pretty happy with where it's at over here. And you could do this with the single ch single chisel. Okay, there we go. And so now we have those holes placed, and I'm just going to continue punching around in line with our border until until I've completed this piece as well. And then whenever I go through and do this piece, the uh, gusset, I'm a lot less particular about the placement on the gusset. Um, I just kind of start uniformly on one end um, and then we'll go from there. So definitely keeping it to a quarter inch on this softer garment leather though. We've punched all the holes. Our leather is nice and dry. We could place our template and use an awl to punch holes through or mark where we needed to punch holes through. Um, but I am going to go through and actually just do the holes here onto this. Uh, the little belt loop part. And um, so I'm going to come in just equidistant from each corner. About right there. Let me zoom in so you guys can see what I'm doing. And I'm getting just these two punched. I'm getting just these two punched. Um, and then I'm going to position this round about here, kind of almost in line with our top edge. And then I'm just gonna punch the holes into our back panel. So nice, clean all the way through. And then I'm going to set a rivet through each hole and fold this over. Here I'm just using small rapid rivets from Tandy Leather. I'm going to feed the stem portion through from the underside to the front. There we go. And I'm going to place the rivet cap just on like that. Now it's you can press it and it's kind of on there, but we will need to use something called a rivet setter. You can see it has a nice concave end and a nice flat end. I'm going to place the concave end over the cap and whack it a bunch. There we are. And I'd like to do this on the nice, hard, flat um, granite surface. That way it gives us a very flat backside. And then I'll just bring this over. Um, to make sure that there's room for the belt, 
you don't want to have it completely like hard flush to the leather so I'm actually going to take our gusset and just fold it in half and then fold it again and I'm going to use this as a buffer to make sure that we do have enough space to be able to fit a belt through there and I want to leave it wide enough that um a lot of the times some of the, some of the renaissance festival style belts um will be you know two inches wide so I, I want to make it so that those belts will be able to fit through here too because you can put a thinner belt through a larger loop but you can't put a thicker belt through a thinner loop so we have this down I'm putting my cutting mat back on the table and and this part is so up to you. You could do any, whatever kind of belt loop or anything that you like. So we have those holes punched. Moving the cutting mat back off the surface. And I'm going to use two more rivets, quick rivets. You don't want to use a rivet with too long of a stem because then um, instead of compressing down nicely, it might bend and warp. And a bent rivet is more likely to rip out. You could also do stitching, but I really prefer rivet, rivets just because they're fast. I've never had any problems with them. They're pretty simple. Simple and straightforward. I like that. There we go. Be sure to put the cap on it before you start hammering. Note to self. And just like that, our belt loop on the back is done. I really recommend doing this part before you start <laughs> stitching pieces together. Um, and so now also the next step using, oh, also for the holes that I was doing on my, uh, for the rivets, I use a 3 30 seconds punch. It's not real important. You just don't want to do a hole that's too big. But if you do a hole that's too small, you're just going to be making problems for yourself. And then I'm using a 1 8 inch hole punch for, I'm going to be using, oh, where'd I put you? There it is. A decorative snap. This one has a really nice, like, Celtic knot going on. Um, and I kind of want it, you can eyeball it, you could do it real far down. I don't recommend doing it too far up the leaf, because whenever it folds over, where are you going to want the snap to be? And I kind of want my snap to be right here. So... I'm just going to kind of center up here on the lobe of the leaf. There we go. We have our hole punched. And then just like before with the belt loop, I'm going to position this front panel roughly about where it's going to be and then fold our lid over. You could do it very far down, but then you're not going to be able to fit as much stuff in your pouch and it shows off a little more of the untooled area than what I would like. So I'm going to bring it up because then we can fit quite a bit of stuff in there and I'm just going to mark this with an awl there we go so we've got our little mark then I'm gonna punch the hole oops hit the camera <laughs> there we are so now going back to our surface I really like these decorative snaps because they come with all the components that they need. And so to do this part, we're going to take the piece that looks like this, kind of flat on the back, feed it through, set that there. And then you can see these two parts, these are what are going to be clipping together. Boop, boop, boop. So, I like for that one to be on this side. And we've got our little setting tool. And I'm sure I've mentioned this, but the links to all the different tools and materials will be down below in the video description. And then I'm going to start hammering it. Now you can see it has this little bit of a nipple here, and that's going to go into the open end of the rivet. And I'm going to be hammering and swiveling, just making sure that it makes a really solid, clean connection. And there you can see it had a little bit of buckling there on the inside because it's a quite thin leather but there's no movement there's no twisting or anything like that so I'm very happy with that and now we're going to do the same thing to the leaf but I'm going to feed 
our decorative Celtic knot through. And then I'm going to be putting that on there. Now I'm not going to be hammering directly on my work surface. I have this little domed snap setter. And I'm using that as an anvil underneath. Like it's going to be sitting on like that, protecting the design, keeping a nice domed shape. And then making sure that's nothing slipping around. Now you're going to hear a little bit of a, I don't know if you can hear that rattling, um, but that's normal. That is this inner part, you can see, that helps it snap on. So it's like, and there we go, that's how the snap works. So that's going to be pretty cool. And then it pops right back off. Definitely secure enough to keep your cell phone and your wallet safe. And so now the next step is going to be to start lacing up the edges. Okay, so here you can see I'm using a half round, two millimeter, three thirty second inch um, calf lace. And what I mean by half round is it has like um, a shiny side that's domed a little bit and then a dull side that's perfectly flat. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to come through and you can see here the ends a little bit wonky that was the very end of the spool but I am going to use a craft knife if I can find my craft knife there it is and I'm sitting it on my flat surface I'm laying the craft knife on its side at a slight angle like maybe a 20 degree angle um, and just slicing in and see how that shaved down our leather a bit it made it significantly thinner and now it'll fit really well into this flat lacing needle which if you can see you open it up and it has these little prongs um, and so I'm just going to insert our little skived edge there that we've shaved down and then I'm going to set this onto my cutting board and I'm going to use a mallet and just to tap it and what that does is it sets those prongs through the leather and now it's in there and I'm going to begin with the front panel because um, again we won't need any of the gusset to exceed past the edge of this panel so I'm finding the raw inside edge of the lacing and I'm just going to feed it through one into and so that's how our leather is going to be lining up but for this first stitch I'm actually just going to feed through just the one the soft leather of the gusset and then pull 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 and I'm going to leave about an inch and a half of tail coming off the side and then I actually just drop my needle entirely and then grabbing close to where the leather or the lacing is exiting the leather I'm just gonna you can see I'm dragging it through getting all the twists and everything out of it and even though it still twists back up it's gonna be okay and if you're just starting out if this is one of your first leather projects I do recommend using a shorter piece of leather um, to avoid this nightmare um, but I hate splicing in more leather so <laughs> I'm doing it like this and then I'm coming around like like if we exited through here I'm looping and I'm going to come back through just trying to make sure that there's no twists in the leather um, and entering through the first hole and then back through the hole that we already laced through and you can uh, I really use my nylon draw pliers a lot for this if you're having trouble getting the needle to come through but you just pull, and then again, I just drop the needle and focus on the lace. You can see how it's coming around. And then take, if it twisted up on itself, take any of the twists out so it sits nice and flat. Make sure that the lacing is in the correct spot. Now, some folks would have contact cemented the edges of their leather together and then punched. 
but I kind of prefer doing it like this because I don't have to worry about messing with any glue. And also, um, I don't want to have to glue this piece and then punch, like let it dry, punch it, lace it, and then glue, oops, glue this piece and then punch it, lace, you know, let it dry, punch it, lace it. It's, I just, just do it all at once. So personal preference though, but a bit of glue here definitely goes a long way. Um, if you're into that, but I'm not too worried about it. And so again, just following around, making sure the lace doesn't have any twists in it, pushing it through both layers of leather, making sure, aha, here you can see our little tail was not where I wanted it to be. So I want to make sure that our little loose tail is tucked up above our needle. And what this is going to accomplish for us is, let me lace this through, um, on the inside of our bag, there's not going to be any, any loose tail poking out. It's just going to be the stitching. Then I'm going to continue all the way around. Um, here I'm just doing a basic whip stitch. But you could also go the decorative route and do some different lacing techniques. I have a book here that I highly recommend. It's called Lacing and Stitching for Leathercraft. And it goes through all sorts of... I mean, this is the complete guide. I really don't know if you would need another book. Um, it talks about all the different tools how to thread different needles, how to, you know, overstitch needles, all sorts of stuff. And also, this isn't just lacing, like what I'm doing here, but also the hand stitching, like the saddle stitching and stuff. But it shows you the whip stitch that we're doing here. And then this one's called the buck stitch, which that's really pretty. And then I also, I'm a particular fan of the single loop lacing, which looks really cool. Hey, Randy, can I see your wallet real quick? I want to show you guys an example of that single loop lacing. Thank you, honey. So you can see here, this is a wallet that I made for Randy years ago, but the edge, the way that the lacing is, it completely encases the edge of the uh, leather. And this is probably my favorite way to finish edges. Um, but it also takes like almost two to three times as much lacing and a lot more time, but man, oh man, it's pretty. Mm. I'm actually going to pull my stitches and, oh, I don't know. No, I'm not. Okay. I'll keep doing the whip stitch on this one, but I really prefer, love the detailing on that. If you can kind of see them completed side by side. So different looks for different folks, but I like it. So on that note, I'm going to keep stitching everything together and um, I will meet you guys back here whenever I'm finishing up the lacing. So whenever you get to the end of your lacing, um, I have enough to do one more stitch comfortably. Um, instead of feeding all the way through like that, I'm just going to hook through one side of the leather and then I'm going to feed up and through back a couple of stitches, like three or four. I'll just do three on this one. And then just pull it through like that. Hi, puppy. Sorry, there's humans that exist outside of the house, so the dogs are barking. Um, <laughs> and so pull that nice and snug, and we can just trim that down. And you could even tuck that in between with the needle if you wanted. And then using the same needle, I've cut another length of thread, or not thread, um, lacing. And I'm going to do the same thing where I lay my craft knife on its side and kind of just skive that down. See how, I mean, it cuts the thickness almost in half, which helps keep our needle from being super bulky. But then it also lets us fit it just right there into the needle. And then I'm gonna use my mallet. You could also, if you have nylon jaw pliers, use your nylon jaw pliers to squeeze it whenever I'm, um doing lacing often whenever we're on long car rides 
I'll have a bunch of projects prepped with all the punching so that all I need to do is the lacing. And then I'll just squeeze it with my nylon gel pliers uh, while I'm sitting there in the passenger seat. And so now from here, we can actually feed down and through. A couple of them. And by a couple of them, I mean a couple of stitches. And then come out right there. Now we're going to carefully pull this through so that it has the correct side facing out. And whenever we get close to the end here, I want to be real careful because I don't know how many times that I've just pulled my lacing all the way out. And so now we are going to just continue as though we never skipped a beat. So now we've made it to the last stitch. And the way I'm going to bind this off is going to feed through the front and I'm going to feed through the back. And I'm going to pull it through. And now I'm going to feed through the front again, but just the front this time. You can see I kind of poked down below. But I'm going to try without putting any twists in the uh, lacing to feed it up and through and back. About four stitches. And that gets it nice and locked down. Then we can snip that real close. Use our needle to tuck it in and make it look like we bound it off with magic. <laughs> and now sometimes I'll have a little bit of excess. I don't, I'd always rather have a little bit of excess than um, have it be too short. So what I do then is I just come in and it would be better done with leather shears than regular scissors. And I'm just going to cut it off at a bit of an angle. And I want to give it a nice clean cut. That is not a very clean cut, you can see there. So if it's not as clean as you want it to be, just go back and redo it. Do your best. There we go. There we go. So now, we're all sorted out. And that's how our snap will come together. There it goes. Nice and secure, that works out really nicely. There it goes. The new snaps can be kind of hard to get on because it's so tight, but it'll relax with time. And so that is, let me zoom out just a bit for you. This is how the bag came out. If y'all have any questions, comments, or ideas, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you can leave a comment down below, or you can find me on any of my social media. Again, links will be down below. Um, the tools and materials, everything, or the best affiliate link that I could find for it will be listed down in Amazon. If you enjoy my work and would like to support the creation of more of it, and you've already liked, shared, and subscribed, and you're already um, one of our pledgers on Patreon, uh, you can purchase things through our Amazon links, and we actually get a small portion of that. It doesn't even have to be what we're linked to. Um, you could follow the link to the Celtic stamps and be like, ah, oh, you know, that's nice, but I really need cat food. Um, and that really does a lot to help our channel out in just providing the tools and materials for these tutorials, as well as covering production fees and costs and everything like that. So I really wanted to thank you guys, though, for all of your generous support. Um, we couldn't do this without you guys. And so I'm trying to give back and help as much as I can. Uh, I'd love to hear about more tutorials that y'all would like to see, um, whether it's something we've touched on a little bit in the past or if it's a completely new technique. And um, yeah, all the links to all the good stuff are down below. <laughs> and um, until next time, happy crafting, guys. I'll see you around. Bye!